thank you, Brenda, and uh, good morning to everyone. And uh, I know Steve just stepped out, but uh, Steve gave a in good introduction to what I'm going to be speaking about this morning. I'll give you a little bit more details on some research results and such. Uh, so I will, I was asked to talk about the placement, but I do have some timing work and I do have some end stabilizer work that I wanted to show you also. So you've heard about this, uh, Steve gave the introduction to this and we used to, way back when, I learned soil fertility and then they changed things to nutrient management, Joe, and you know, the environmental aspect has been around for a while and some states have focused more on it than other states. I came up through Florida and it, even in the 70s it was a big concern with phosphate and nitrates on sandy soils and in the southeast, but more and more were uh, with the Gulf of Mexico hypoxia situation and things of that nature, the Midwest now where they use the most fertilizer it has become a, a focus. So IPNI has this program education of, of really trying to uh, put everything together and get you to think about these things. And the way I like to put it, I like to call it strategic nitrogen fertilization, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more as I go on why I, why I call it this. But when we're looking at fertilizer, especially nitrogen, it's, it's the source, but it includes also the availability. You know, it's easy to say you should be using this source, but if you can't get it, uh, that's not going to help you, all right? And price is also important, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Another factor is trying to optimize the nitrogen rate, okay? Gone are the days where we can put on that little bit of extra in case I need it, all right? We've got to, what I like to talk about is hitting the bullseye. We need to get closer to that bullseye, as close to that bullseye as we can with the correct rate. And secondly, that'll, that'll maximize our economic returns because that's really what you want. This is an input. And if you talk to an ag economist, you're trying to maximize output relative to inputs. And fertilizer nitrogen is an input, all right? Timing is, is important. And uh, Steve addressed some of that earlier on. We, we want to maximize end use efficiency. It's one of those nutrients that can get away from us, all right? Placement. You've heard a little bit about that, and I'll show you some of that. And I'll talk a little bit about minimizing losses uh, using these stabilizers, inhibitors, et cetera, that are out there on the market. Most of you have seen the, the nitrogen cycle, and I'm not going to test you on this later, but uh, you can see how nitrogen can be lost from a system. Depending on the source, you use urea and it's put on the surface. Some can be lost through ammonia volatilization. You use ammonium nitrate. Uh, some of that nitrate on sandy, uh, highly permeable soils with a heavy rain, you can lose significant amounts of your nitrate. On the heavier soils, the nitrate form can, can denitrify. So you can see nitrogen is susceptible to these, to these loss mechanisms, so you do have to be wary about it. All right. You saw this graph earlier with, with Steve, just in a little bit different manner, but you do need to understand your crop uptake. Uh, demand by the crop, but also when do I need to timely, logistically get it in the field? And it's easy to tell you, you should apply it exactly at V3. Well, I work with growers in Mississippi Delta. They may have three to six, 7,000 acres or more of corn, and they're not going to do that in one day, okay? And then weather gets in the way too. But you do have to be cognizant of this, and of course your fields were not planted all the same day, so you're going to try to follow that pattern. You're going to get on your drier soils planted earlier and your wetter ones later. So you do have to kind of uh, have a good idea of the nutrient uptake pattern by your crop. And so this just kind of shows corn. I don't put any nitrogen in any of my studies. I don't put it out pre-plant. And I, and I really try to get growers not, in the Mississippi Delta especially, not to put nitrogen out pre-plant. We've had cotton farmers for years that would put out in, uh, especially anhydrous ammonia, they would start real early, February, March. Uh, some like uh, to put a burn down out and they'll put some nitrogen in with that. Well, the research we've done, we've seen that they've, they're losing 30 to 50, 60 pounds of that nitrogen. That's expensive if they get rainfall prior to planting that crop. So I usually plant my crop V3 or so, I'll put that first split on, and then V5, V6, V7, get that second split on. So do understand that. Now let's look at here three states. You know, of course, I'm working in Mississippi. Alabama's just across the border. 
And, of course, let's look at a corn-producing state. Let's look at a state that grows 10 to 11 million acres of corn. We think in Mississippi we grow a lot of corn at 800,000 acres, okay? Now, you look at what the growers in Illinois use. What is their number one fertilizer in Illinois? It's anhydrous ammonia, over 600,000 tons of nitrogen. That's not tons of fertilizer. That's tons of the element nitrogen. Okay, then there's almost 300,000 tons of nitrogen as end solutions, but their number one fertilizer is anhydrous ammonia. There's a reason for that, okay, and, I, and I'll show you that here in a little bit. Uh, Mississippi, we used to do a lot of anhydrous ammonia, but we've gotten away with it. Besides the druggies and the, the equipment things and such like that, it's just we've evolved to using nitrogen solutions, all right. Yeah, it's pretty crazy when somebody tries to break in an anhydrous ammonia tank. I wouldn't touch one, but, you know, I guess if you're high on drugs and you need some more, <laughs> you'll go for it. Crazy. Now, look at Alabama, though. Look at your nitrogen uses. This is for 2012, and this is the most recent data that is uh, currently available. You all still love, you know, have that love affair with ammonium nitrate. It's a great fertilizer. I love ammonium nitrate, too. Uh, works great, spreadable, about 34% N. And nitrogen solutions uh, come in about half that rate, but still significant. But just even look at your total end use, compare Mississippi to Alabama, you can tell the row crop situation in this state is a lot less, and the corn is probably less than it is in, in Mississippi. We have the Delta, of course, but neither of us compare to Illinois. All right, so you see why they're the focus of this uh, nutrients coming down the Mississippi River, because they have drain tile and things like that, and, and some of that nitrogen leaks. But Moving on, anhydrous ammonia, of course, is about 82% nitrogen, doesn't have any water in it, about five pounds per gallon, uh, four pounds of nitrogen per gallon. It's a gas kept under pressure. You know some of this stuff. But you and uh, urea ammonium nitrate solution, the 32% that we use in Mississippi, uh, there's 2.24 gallons of water per gallon of that, uh, uh, pounds of water, excuse me, per gallon of, of material. All right, so 200 pounds of nitrogen applied to a field, we've just dragged around 126 gallons of water around that field too, all right? Ammonium nitrate, popular fertilizer still in, in Alabama. Of course, it's prilled, hygroscopic, et cetera. Uh, what I have down there, the solutions have been cut. In, in the U.S. right now, it's neck and neck each year between anhydrous ammonia and N solutions. And one or two years, end solutions have actually beat out anhydrous ammonia. And that's what I call the price of convenience. The liquids are more convenient, anhydrous ammonia. There's some hazards associated with it. There's equipment, specialized equipment, et cetera. But even that's changing because there's newer precision uh, equipment with anhydrous ammonia that's really good, really good. All right. Now let's look at prices. Doesn't, they seem to go up, they, they come down for a year or two, and then they go back up. <laughs> you see about 1974 or so when we had the oil embargo, when we really had a, uh, oil prices jump. Uh, given the current market of oil at $40, $50 a barrel right now, fertilizer prices should be cheap, right? Next spring, Joe, right? <laughs> we'll see how, much they, how long this lasts and if, if they do come down. It's always been said that fertilizer prices are tied to uh, oil prices. Of course, natural gas is used to make fertilizer, and the energy costs comprise about 80% of the cost of making nitrogen fertilizer. But understand this, the U.S. now imports more than 50% of its fertilizer nitrogen. Good for national security? I don't think so. All right, but that's where we're at in the United States. We used to make pretty much all our own nitrogen years ago. And now we're dependent on foreign sources because our plants have gotten old. We've mothballed them. We've closed them down. All right. So here's price anhydrous ammonia. They did uh, jump up there, 08, 09, and then, then came down. But uh, then they're back up. And, uh, but you can see the price per ton. But I want to talk a little bit more specific here. Anhydrous ammonia in 2012 averaged $847 a ton. That's 52 cents per pound of nitrogen. Okay. Urea ammonium nitrate solution at 30%, $400 a ton, 68 cents per pound of nitrogen. Remember, you're applying pounds of nitrogen, okay? That's what you're paying for. Urea, 60 cents a pound of nitrogen. You want to use ammonium nitrate, 80 cents a pound ammonium nitrate, okay? 
uh, for the nitrogen and ammonium nitrate. So let's take cotton in as an example. Uh, average on rate of Mississippi, somewhere around 100 pounds of N versus anhydrous ammonia or ammonium nitrate. Well, I have it as a negative because if you choose to use ammonium nitrate over anhydrous ammonia, you've docked yourself $28 an acre from the get-go, okay? Uh, corn at 200 pounds of nitrogen uh, per acre, anhydrous ammonia. Think of Illinois. Think of Illinois versus Alabama here. They're using anhydrous ammonia versus ammonium nitrate. You just docked yourself minus $56 an acre in what you can make in profit compared to a grower in Illinois. And that's why they use anhydrous ammonia. Besides the high-end content, they don't have to haul as much around. It is cheap. It is a cheap source of nitrogen. And so I put this as in cotton. When we switch from cotton to corn, because the corn in Mississippi is going on cotton ground in the delta. The best cotton ground is receiving the corn. Uh, we basically, it's less labor to grow the corn. So we're trading labor costs, what were once labor costs, for that extra 100 pounds of nitrogen, you know, 52 to $80 an acre. We're putting it in in fertilizer. Getting the right rate, you do, uh, with, the, uh, with the source, you do have to understand that there is an optimum rate for your fields, field by field, your soils. I can't tell you exactly what that is, and that's something you intuitively, have a, as a grower, you usually have a pretty good idea of. And I found working with growers most of the time, they, they have a pretty good idea of what the field average is. Now, they can't exactly spatially apply it, to get it right, but they know what the field average is. Now you see with, this is just an example here, uh, ammonium nitrate uh, maximizing growth somewhere uh, between 150 and 200 pounds of N, whereas look at UN in the upper right, it's very efficient. We reach, we, have, we produced almost 200 bushel corn with about 150 pounds of N. So there's your end use efficiency factor. With urea, it just seems like the graph, and this is just one year, but I've done this uh, for other years, that urea just seems to keep, keep going up. You need more urea because of the losses involved with urea when you're using urea. Ammonium nitrate uh, is better than your, much better than urea, and it's not as good as UM, but it's close in its efficiency, as long as you don't get heavy rains after applying it and such on sandy soils. And I know Mississippi State recommends about a pound and a quarter of nitrogen per bushel. Uh, personally, I don't recommend that. I never see that, and I'm somewhere around a pound of nitrogen per, per bushel at the rates and yields that I'm in dry land corn. All right, let's talk about ink irrigation effects a little bit. Uh, sprinkle irrigation, of course, sometimes you see puddling. You know, you try to get that water on, that pivot's moving slow. Uh, you may have some more poorly drained areas or compacted areas in the field where you might see some puddling. Furrow irrigation, of course, is just that. You're putting water in the furrow, you're flooding it. It used to be called flood irrigation, but those furrows get flooded. Water moves, nitrogen moves. So one study we did is we wanted to know, uh, most of our growers, it's much easier with the drivers that they have, uh, equipment, et cetera, is just put those coulters, those knives, right down in the middle of the furrow. And that's where they run them. And then they furrow irrigate on top of that. So we wanted to just look at a simple study here, six inches from the row banded, uh, urea ammonium nitrate, 12 inches, and 18 inches. And when we looked at total end content, we cut whole plants at the end of the season when it was matured and look at the, the end content. And I've got surface uh, dribbled is the, the circles and then subsurface band. And so I also have placement here, whether it's on the surface or in the soil, as well as distance from the row. And so you see with subsurface band, it didn't make quite that much uh, difference from 15 to 30 centimeters, but definitely when we got out there in the furrow, when we put that nitrogen out in the furrow, we, we dropped in uh, total end content by the plant. Whereas with the, in the irrigated condition, with the subsurface band, it didn't make, uh, I mean with the uh, surface dribble, did not make as much a difference. And the non-irrigated uh, treatments, of course, the end uptake was lower because of less water availability and seemed to make some trend for moving out further from the row that total end content decreased, and that was in 2011. 2012 was a wetter year. We had greater rainfall, higher yields, 
but we also had the potential for greater losses. So once again, with the subsurface band, it didn't make quite a difference whether it was 15 to 30 centimeters, but that 30 centimeters, understand, is still in the bed. We, we grow this on beds, and so that is just on that edge of the bed where that 45 centimeters is out there in, in the furrow. So you see with both treatments really a decline as we move further away from the row, and the, the non-irrigated, it was pretty dramatic also, especially with the uh, surface dribble, that we had a decline in, in total land uptake by the plant. So we were also doing an M15 study, which is a fancy uh, technique where we actually have a tracer on that nitrogen fertilizer that we put in the soil. So we can actually follow the fertilizer that we, that we put on. And you can see the same effect with the subsurface banded as we move further from the row. We decreased in uh, N15 recovery from about 58% to about 42%. That's pretty significant loss there. Uh, sub, the surface dribble did not matter quite as much. Uh, that was in 2011. In 2012, however, though, with the greater rainfall, I believe we had greater losses, especially with that nitrogen out there in the, in the furrow, where it was susceptible to be in uh, wetter conditions and, and potential for denitrification. So we went from high recoveries of 75 to 80% down to about 55% of our nitrogen. Well, what did it do to yield? Well, in 2011, you see the, the trend there was most dr dramatic for the subsurface banded that we declined in yield, what, about uh, 25 bushels. Is that significant? That's a lot of bushels, all right? With the uh, surface dribble, not quite as much, only about five or so bushels. In the non-irrigated, uh, the decline was not as great. Uh, the graphs are a little dramatic because I've, I've got them blown up, but really we're only looking at about an eight bushel uh, decline though, but I might say only eight bushels. A grower might say, hey, you can give me eight bushels, I'll take it. In 2012, it was a little more significant. As we move further out in the row with our nitrogen placement, you know, here's, here's getting the, the, you know, you talk about the right source, the right rate, this is the right uh, placement here, is the further we get out in the row, we lost uh, about 40 bushels. That's a lot of corn. And that was with irrigation. With the non-irrigated, although we didn't make as high a yield, the, uh, the decline there was about 40, 35, 40 bushels also. All right? Okay. Well, moving off of that, also we looked at uh, timing a little bit, source, and then nitrogen stabilizers. And so these are the treatments that we have. We have an untreated check where we don't put any nitrogen on, a split 50-50. You uh, in a single application. What we're looking at here is, is can growers put on a one shot when corn is at V3, V4 and walk away from that field for the most part for the season? Can they put their one ray on? Because they'll save in application costs. And so we said, well, if they're doing a the one shot, number four, we added the uh, NSERV nitropyrone, which is really instinct by Dow Agrosciences. And then uh, number five is UN plus the urease inhibitor. And number six, this is my made up treatment of adding the NSERV and the instinct together. Put a nitrification inhibitor and the urease inhibitor together with the UN. And this is banded. And then we had urea in there as a source untreated and with the a uh, urease inhibitor. And a lot of questions about whether to use agrotain or not. I get phone calls on that all the time. So in the leaf end content, not a lot of difference. Difference between the years. We didn't see, these are uh, ear leaves taken at, uh, or when it was just starting to tassel at, at VT. So we don't see a lot of difference bet between the treatments. Uh, nitropyrin or the NSERV, a little bit of increase there in one year, not the, not the next year. Uh, the MBT agrotain helped, seemed to help a little bit with the UN. The combo didn't seem to make much difference. But definitely when you add the MBBT, the agrotain, to the urea with the last two treatments, it definitely, definitely makes a difference here both, both years. All right? And that's just the nature of urea, susceptible ammonia volatilization. It's important to uh, protect it. When we look at whole end plant content, we definitely, uh, we saw that splitting was more efficient if we split the end. Okay, so this is a split application versus 
Nitropyrin seemed to help a little bit in the, in the single, but not much, probably not enough to really uh, maybe invest in it. But then the agrotain, we increased about 13 uh, pounds or kilograms of nitrogen per hectare greater in, in that treatment. And then the combo added, added another pound or so. Not big differences, but definitely a trend. Uh, urea is the most significant here. If you're not going to protect that urea, you may have trouble if it's just broadcast on the surface. So you can see where protecting urea with the agrotain made a big, big, big difference. All right, well, what did that mean in yield? Not a lot, and unfortunately, sometimes this is what we see with these products. We see greater end use efficiency, uh, but not usually in too much in terms of yield. Uh, the split application wasn't much better than the single application, even though the end use efficiency, the uptake was a little bit greater. Uh, UN with uh, NSERV didn't help. UN with MBBT didn't seem to help much, but the combo together seemed to, to increase yield about four bushels or so. Once again, the biggest difference was urea unprotected and then urea uh, protected and about a nine uh, bushel increase or so. Definitely a difference if I choose using urea, which costs me a lot more money over using UAN, all right? How many in here use liquid urea ammonium nitrate solutions as their primary end source? Hand, show of hands. How many use dry, like ammonium nitrate, still? Uh, urea, anybody? Not many, okay. All right, so to, Summarize this, this, what I'm calling strategic fertilizer management, it costs money, but nowadays it does, it's not only that it costs money, the EPA is, is looking at us and looking at growers and looking at that nitrogen and where it's going. So we've got to improve the efficiency of it. It costs a lot of money, nitrogen. You know, it represents 35 to 40% of the input costs of growing corn in Mississippi. 200, uh, our growers are using 240 pounds of nitrogen or so. That's, that's a lot of money. So, you know, what else costs you that money, that much money, you know, to produce that much yield boost? Uh, irrigation, maybe. Tillage doesn't. Weed control, uh, maybe. Uh, Insect control, probably not. So per strategic application, uh, I believe, can make a difference. So in, in the placement, if you're using the liquids, I believe that the closer you get it, at least six to nine inches or so from the planted row will help you, all about two, three inches deep. Timing, I've always recommended. The, the split application is an insurance policy. You know, I'm going to tell people that it only works about one, two years out of ten years, but it's, you know, those two years that you get that heavy rain or something and washes your nitrogen away that you're going to, that you're going to have trouble. So it, it is an insurance policy of splitting it. And uh, timing, of course, total amount of irrigation, you adjust your rates relative to irrigation. Really what we're, uh, main focus of a lot of my research right now has been on variable rate fertilization. And we're getting some really good results on that with, with cotton and looking forward to moving more into doing some on-farm research with the corn model that we have. Uh, inhibitors, this is how I answer. Uh, questions about inhibitors. It's, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, are you no-till? You know, I got to ask a lot of questions. Are you applying it no-till? Is it late in the season? Are temperatures high? Uh, of course, are you using urea? Uh, do you have a high residue situation where you can have volatile losses, placement, etc.? cetera? All, all important factors, all important things to, to think about. And, and I know it's a, a little bit complicated. Nitrogen is always the most difficult test exam in my class, is that, that uh, exam number two, the students fear nitrogen, but, but it's the one that costs you, costs you quite a bit of money, and then P and, and K are right there with it. So any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them if I have any. I guess I have a couple minutes here. Any questions? Yes, sir. Evaluation there at the end where you showed the combination of the uh, MBPT and the, uh, the, the, the instinct, yes, yeah, yeah. the, the stain, whatever. Um, what's the cost differential to applying both of those inhibitors as opposed to applying only one of those? That's 
a very pertinent question, which I don't have the current costs of that. Uh, and if anybody is here representing those products, but you know, each of them are going to be a couple dollars an acre, two fifty to three dollars or more an acre. Well, both of them together would probably be six, seven dollars an acre or so. But you're going to put one. Yeah. So if, if you, I mean, it's only another three dollars. But if you consist, consistently show uh, a three, four bushel. Oh, the break even's only going to be a couple bushels. You're yeah, correct. Yeah. So you, you know, it, it, it makes sense to put both of them in there. Does Most that, of the time, it. Would, if you get that yield boost, yes. Yeah. Would 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 that uh, by by the utilization of both of those inhibitors? Could you then justify putting that nitrogen down all at one time so that it, it, it spreads it out over a period of time? That's what that was. That was a one-shot application, and that's what we were trying to test. If we're going to do that one-shot, and we're going to leave that fertilizer out there susceptible and prone to the hazards of weather and Mother Nature, should we protect it? And, and basically... It, you know, with two years of data, I hope to get a third year of data because the more years we can get, the better uh, we can support uh, our results. And uh, well, gonna, I, I doubt very seriously you'll ever get a, a statistical difference of, of 11 to 12 bushels per acre, but, but four or five bushels would certainly pay for the practice with it. If, if you notice, I didn't talk about statistics a lot. <laughs> Because that, that is, in fact, true. And, you know, when talking to a grower, and if you can tell them you can do this and you can get five bushels, they're probably going to do it. So I leave the decision making up to the grower. Yes, sir. Dr. Margaret, have you looked at what the inhibitor of when it's available, uh, worrying about time if you're actually not to be available at some time, or, or when that release timing is? Uh, the, the question is whether that inhibitor is tying up the nitrogen or not making it uh, available. Now in the case of urea, urea itself is not really available to the plant. You know, plant roots can take up small amounts of actual urea. So you need that to transform first of all to the ammonium, which a plant could take up ammonium, and then to the nitrate form. And that period in, in lab studies that we've seen at the recommended rates Depending on temperatures, now if you plant corn in cool weather, that temperature is going to slow it down too, that transformation. So if you put the combination of the inhibitor plus cool temperatures, uh, it's a two, three week period that really uh, inhibits that, slows that process. It's never 100% stops that process, okay? So you've got to think about it, you know, corn plant this big isn't using much nitrogen. And there's some nitrogen available from the soil. So uh, in, in terms of what I would say, tying it up, I don't think it's a, I would not guess that it's a big factor there, especially if it was timely, was done early V3 before. Within two, three weeks when it warms up, that stuff should be, uh, you saw the growth curves, it should be mineralized, nitrifying, and, and matching that, the demand. That's what you're trying to do is, is match that demand. So you have to decide on that, your application time, but it, it's a couple days. 10 to 14 days is pretty good on their literature or what they say and what I've seen in lab studies and such. But cool temperatures will slow it down. Yes, sir. That is knifed at about 8, 9 inches is where I have my coulter set and about 2, 3 inches deep. Yes, sir. Replacement study. Um, was your dry land corn on flat or was it on bed as well? This is not flat ground. These are, uh, it is, it, it's no till, but it's on the remnants of conventional till. We typically hip up, make beds, knock them down in conventional till. And ge generally, when I go into no till, I'm going into that situation. I like to have a little bed there. It is furrow, so you have to have beds. You know, you have to have some kind of furrow to furrow irrigate. Would you expect the same kind of difference in the fertilizer placement on a flat, no-till situation? That's a great 
it, it, that's a great distinction, you know, because on flat ground, you're not going to have that as much, but you're still going to have wheel tracks and things of that nature where you could have some problems, say, from overhead irrigation. You know, you're going to have some slight undulations that, that could cause some of these problems, some wet spots, but probably not as great. This was really for, this was, the research was really designed for Mississippi Delta, furrow irrigated, which most of our growers now are going back to furrow. They're getting rid of the pivots, by the way. The pivots are old. They didn't put out, since now they're in corn, they don't put out enough water for corn, the older technology, so they're scrapping them, and, and unbelievably we're going back to furrow irrigation. <laughs> and polypipe has made that, you know, easy for them. Anything else? If not, uh, appreciate your attention this morning. Thank you. <laughs>